Okay, so last time we met, we left off talking about different neurotransmitters that are sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems utilized. This is important because these neurotransmitters will ultimately decide what the target organ does. You know, for example, if you have the parasympathetic nervous system active, you're going to release acetylcholine. That causes the heart to slow down. Okay, your heart has specific receptors for acetylcholine, but your heart also has what we call adrenergic receptors, which are going to bind norepinephrine and epinephrine, which are the two major neurotransmitters that are released, and specifically, mainly, we're talking norepinephrine here. And these are released by what we call adrenergic fibers, by sympathetic post-ganglion neurons, and by the adrenal medulla, which, remember, is releasing epi and norepi into the blood, which is why they would be classified as hormones. If I go back a couple of slides here, I can show you what I was talking about. Okay. Remember, acetylcholine is re released by the first neuron no matter what. Okay. Acetylcholine is released by preganglionic neurons for the sympathetic that innervate postganglionic neurons. They also are released, acetylcholine is also released by preganglionic neurons at the adrenal medulla. And then with the parasympathetic, it's acetylcholine by the pre and the post. Now, there's a good chance you might see one or two of these figures on the test, where I might ask you, you know, which is being shown, somatic, parasympathetic, or sympathetic. If it's somatic, we know it's going to be somatic because there's one neuron. If it's sympathetic, the first is going to be short, and the second is going to be long. If it's parasympathetic, it's going to be short, or it's going to be long, then short. Long, pre, short, post. I might even ask you which neurotransmitters are being released. And with, without knowing, you might, or if you don't know, your best guess is probably going to be acetylcholine. Because look, acetylcholine, 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 acetylcholine. The only place that's different is with the sympathetic postganglionic neurons, which release norepinephrine, and then the adrenal medulla, which releases epinephrine and norepinephrine into the blood as hormones. There is one variance to this rule. Okay. Norepinephrine and epinephrine, specifically norepinephrine, are not always released by the postganglionic neurons. We can see that here. When the postganglionic neuron innervates wet sweat glands, it's going to release acetylcholine again. So it's acetylcholine, then acetylcholine again, versus for everything else, which would be like your heart muscle, your blood vessel, smooth muscle. It's going to be norepinephrine at the first, or it's going to be acetylcholine at the first neurotrans synapse, excuse me, between the pre and the post. The second synapse between the postganglionic and the effector will be norepinephrine. The receptors that bind norepinephrine and epinephrine are called alphas and betas, alpha adrenergic, beta adrenergic. And there are several different classes of those, but these are the two majors. Okay. Alphas usually have excitatory effects, like causing blood vessels to constrict. And blood vessels constrict when the muscles contract, okay. which means that the muscles are excited. Betas can be different. In some cases, they can be more excitatory. In other places, they can be inhibitory. For example, beta 2s will dilate smooth muscle, which means that they relax the muscle. Versus like beta 1s, we find these on our hearts, they cause the heart to beat stronger and faster. Okay. So in some cases, like here with the beta 2s, they inhibit. Down here with these, they excite. Okay. This collection of figures might also show up on the test. Okay, so make sure you know it as well, along with the nerve transmitters <coughs> that are released. And the receptors, because that's really kind of the main thing. We're talking receptors here and neurotransmitters. 
Now, there are several drugs that can either act like a neurotransmitter or inhibit the binding of those neurotransmitters to their receptors. So drugs can be an uh, imposter or a blocker of neurotransmitters. We can classify those that bind to receptors and activate them, which means that they're like a mimic or an imposter, as agonists. Phenylephrine is a nasal, nasal decongestant. That's an example of an agonist. An antagonist does the opposite. It binds to that receptor and prevents the neurotransmitters that are naturally produced from binding to it, which means that they will not produce the effect. The example would be beta blockers. Anybody ever heard of beta blockers before? Beta blockers are a group of drugs that people get put on like if they have heart disease or high blood pressure. What beta blockers do is they block the beta receptors, like these beta ones that we just talked about. If they block the beta receptors, that means the heart won't go faster or stronger. And that's going to lower your blood pressure because when your heart speeds up, your blood pressure goes up. Okay. People get put on these, like I said, when they have heart disease or after like a heart attack, which is a, unfortunately very common situation in America. So if you end up in the medical field of some sort, it's a good chance you're going to be dealing with patients that have beta blockers in their system. So the last little bit here on sympathetic parasympathetic is just a kind of summary of what those two divisions do. With a, with a listing of some kind of specifics here. Once again, the sympathetic nervous system is activated in response to a stress that increases that fight or flight response. And that's going to provide us with mechanisms that allow us to either fight or flight, which are both examples of a physical activity. Okay. So it can be like a life and death situation, like running into a bear or running away from a bear, or something as simple as, you know, hopping on a treadmill. You have to activate the sympathetic nervous system. In order to exercise, and we'll talk about this in detail later in the semester, it requires energy. What is our body's favorite form of energy? ATP. So we're going to do everything we can to make ATP. Okay. Now, dilating our pupils isn't really related to that, but that helps us see better so we can run or fight better. Our heart rate's going to go up, our blood pressure's going to go up, which means that we're pumping more blood. Okay. The blood pressure goes up because we constrict the blood that supplies our or blood vessels that supply our kidneys and GI tract. Because when we're running away from a bear, are we worried about digesting the food that we ate earlier or making the pee? No. What we're trying to do is get the blood to our working parts, which are skeletal muscles, cardiac muscles, and then our liver and adipose tissues because that's where we store glycogen, which we're going to try to break down to glucose because we can use glucose to make ATP. And we break down fat, which can then also be used to make ATP. Now, we make ATP aerobically, which means we need what? Oxygen, and where is oxygen? The air that we breathe, right? So that's why we would dilate our airways. Breathe in more air, more oxygen, more ATP production. All those things allow us to contract our muscles in either fight or flight. On the other end of the spectrum is the parasympathetic responses, which are all active in you guys right now. We call this the rest and digest response. If you can rem remember the acronym SLUD, those are kind of the five things that are produced when we have that person that nervous system active. Slide is short for salivation, production of saliva, lacrimation. What's lacrimation? May I have a guess? Yeah, lacrimal gland are your glands that produce tears, but we're not always crying, are we? 
but we're producing fluids that keep our eyeball from drying out. So that's what lacrimation is. Urination, that's obviously peeing, digestion, breaking down food, absorbing the nutrients, and then what's not absorbed would be defecated, which is just a fancy way of scratch pooping. All those responses help us conserve, conserve and restore body energy. At this point, our digestive and urinary functions will be increased, and any body function that supports act physical activity will be decreased. For a more specific look at what happens to our organs, excuse me, we can look at table 15.4. <clears throat> table 15.4 actually spills onto two slides here, where we're going down structure by structure and looking at what happens to them in response to sympathetic versus parasympathetic. Fortunately for you guys, you don't need to worry about these two tables. But I do want you to know this figure here. It's kind of it's a simpler way of showing what's happening. A lot of those things. Not everything, but for a lot of them. On the left there, you have the parasympathetic division and what it does to various things. For example, it constricts your pupils versus sympathetic, which dilates them. It's important to understand that these various organs, like our eyes, are going to have input from both sympathetic and parasympathetic. But as we talked about, it's like a teeter-totter. When sympathetic is active, parasympathetic is not. When parasympathetic is active, sympathetic is not. Okay, right now, you guys and people are probably fairly constricted. They might be a little bit dilated since you are in a darker room. But constricted pupils indicating parasympathetic is active. Heart rate is slow. That's a, probably a better one. Parasympathetic is active. Heart rate will accelerate if the sympathetic is activated. There will be several questions where I ask sympathetic versus parasympathetic stuff. So make sure you know. Last thing I want to talk about in this lecture are autonomic reflexes and the integration and control of our autonomic nervous system. Now, the great thing about autonomic reflexes is they're actually very similar to somatic reflexes. They both utilize five parts of a reflex arc. Receptors, sensory neurons, integrating center, motor neurons, and effectors. It's just a little bit of variance in what's what. And we'll talk more about these reflexes than the ones that we talked about on Wednesday. And we don't really ever get back into stretch reflex like tapping on the tendon of your knee, causing your leg to kick out. But we will talk about things like blood pressure changes and what our body does in response to them. Changes in our body when we digest food. Okay, so we'll talk about some of these various autonomic reflexes at various points in the semester. Okay. Here's what an autonomic reflex arc is going to look like. Just like the figure, pretty much anyway, that we saw on Wednesday for a somatic reflex. <coughs> it begins with sensor receptors, which are going to be the dendrites of a unipolar sensory neuron. In this case, this is going to be a spinal reflex because the spinal cord is involved. The spinal cord is going to be the integrating center. But for most of our autonomic reflexes, the main integrating center is going to be in the hypothalamus and brainstem. Something I'll probably highlight. For things like blood pressure, we have to send those signals up into the brain and let the brain sort it out and decide what to do. Okay. Remember how the hypothalamus does just about anything and everything? especially autonomic, well, it's going to be the major control center of these autonomic reflexes. Now, some reflexes, like urination, defecation, do use the spinal cord, so that doesn't mean that this figure is completely wrong. Just not all of them. Most of them will actually involve the brain instead of the spinal cord. Okay. Now, a big difference between somatic and autonomic, as we know, Autonomic uses two neurons to get to the effectors. The preganglionic neuron and then the postganglionic neuron. <laughs> and then where they meet is autonomic ganglia. 
Another big difference is who's being the effectors. With somatic, who are the effectors? Not cardiac for smooth muscle, but skeletal muscle. With autonomic, it's going to be smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, or glands, as we see here. As you guys probably already guessed, or have already guessed, when we have these various autonomic reflexes, most of the time we don't even know it. We don't necessarily know when our heart changes a few beats because our blood pressure drops, or when we start our breathing to speed up a little bit because our O2 levels drop. Most of the time, these things are done without our conscious awareness or perception. Okay. As previously mentioned, back on Wednesday, we talked about our hypothalamus and that it is the major control and integrating center of our autonomic nervous system. Input for this autonomic nervous system structure comes from visceral functions, like, um, well, I'm not going to say like, but comes from visceral functions, olfaction and gestation. Remember, olfaction is smell. Gestation is taste. Also receives input for changes in temperature, blood osmolarity, or water levels, and levels of various substances like hydrogen ions, or O2, or CO2, among many other things that we find in our blood. Receives input also from our limbic system. Do you guys remember the nickname for the limbic system? This was our emotional brain. Emotions will provide the hypothalamus with ways to change our reflexes. Think about what happens to your blood pressure due to various emotional responses. We'll talk about the role that the limbic system has with that later in the semester. The output will go down to the brain stem and spinal cord from the hypothalamus. And if it's for sympathetic responses, it's going to come from the posterior lateral parts of the hypothalamus. If it's a parasympathetic, it's going to come from the anterior medial parts, which is kind of cool that two different regions of the hypothalamus control those two different divisions. Okay, any questions on that? Yes. 